All right, so we're going to get in. I'm going to talk about a couple little things real quick, and then we're going to get into really the meat of why we're here um, today. And again, like Mike said, don't feel defeated. You know, um, it's easy to get up here and say, you know, these are the things you should be doing. Applying them are two totally different things. It takes discipline. It takes diligence. It takes all of those things, but you can do it. I mean, honestly, and, it, and God can use you, whether you've only got a few years left or a lot of years left, God can use you mightily for the kingdom, okay? So don't, don't, don't walk out of here feeling defeated. Also, earlier, when I was talking about, you know, the things that we should be doing as we grow into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and it's going to grow into our marriage, and it's also going to grow into our kids. I want you to understand that your wife and your kids have a mind, heart, and soul themselves, too, Okay? Just because you're living the godly life doesn't necessarily mean that they will, okay? Because if, if everybody's trying to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, it looks really good. But if you've got somebody who is in sin, uh, who does not have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, or is walking with the enemy, then it's going to be hard. But don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop reading your Bible. Don't stop... You know, praying. Don't stop having that repentant lifestyle. Don't try. Don't stop trying to read the Bible with your wife or your kids, and so forth and so on. But don't get defeated either. Okay. Sometimes you got to be like Jesus did with Peter. Give him over to Satan. You know, or you know, say, "Hey, I'm, I'm not going to give you over to Satan." But sometimes we're going to have to do those things and just say, "All right, you know, maybe they'll come back uh, to the grace of Jesus Christ." Um, our man of ministry consists of, uh, you know. My books that I've authored, this is the first book that I wrote. It's called Man Up, Becoming a Godly Man in an Ungodly World. And it talks about the seven things in a Christian man's life with their spiritual sissies. And we're going through those today. Uh, the book that you will receive this afternoon uh, for coming to the conference is called Pursuit of a Godly Life. And this is it's more theological than my first book. And it literally breaks down the chapter of Second Peter, verses 5 through 12. And what I did was I took faith. And I took diligence, wrote a chapter on it. I took faith, wrote a chapter on it, so forth and so on. And so it'll be a really good book for you to take back. It has a workbook at the end of each um, chapter. And it's a great small group study, a great uh, discipleship study, so forth and so on. Our website has our t-shirts. Um, we also have an app. Anybody got a smartphone in here? All right. If you got a Google uh, play If you've got an Android or an iPhone, we have on Google Play as well as iTunes, the Man Up God's Way app. And it's a phenomenal app. We've got over 25,000 downloads on it. And so we've got a, a community of men that have come alongside each other. It's got a prayer wall, hurdle wall, resources, challenges, stuff like that. It's a really, really good app. If you're on Facebook, we have over 760,000 people following us on Facebook. And so social media has been really good to us, um, and we're trying to just take away what Satan is using for bad and bring it back for good as well. If you have an issue with pornography and you're not, uh, do you, you don't want to discuss it here, don't want to confess it here, whatever, uh, my email address is jody at manofgodsway.org. Uh, I have resources for you. We have an accountability app. Um, we have uh, books that we can get to you. We can help you alongside of that as well. Okay, so that's the marketing side. Let's get back to preaching and teaching. Um, I'm not in this for the money, just so you guys know. Uh, this, you know, whether you buy anything from me, I could care less. Uh, God has taken care of me far better than I could ever imagine. So um, I just want you guys to know that you're not obligated to buy anything from me uh, whatsoever. So, church. <laughs> How many of you think church is important in your Christian walk? Okay. Let me give you a few statistics here that um, I put in my book here. The U.S. congregation, the typical U.S. congregation, draws an adult crowd that's 61% female and 39% male. And this gender gap shows up in all categories, children, youth, um, old folks, whatever you want to call it. On any given Sunday, there are 13 million more adult women than, Amer than men in American churches. This Sunday, almost 25% of married church-going women will go without their husbands. Midweek activities, which is a Wednesday night, anybody have a Wednesday night discipleship or church or anything like that, um, often draw 70 to 80% women. 
compared to men. The majority of church employees are women except for ordained clergy. Over 70% of the boys who are being raised in church will abandon in their teens and 20s, and most of them will never return. When you add the girls in there, it goes up to 89%. And so more than 90% of American men believe in God, and five out of six call themselves Christians, but only two out of six attend church on any given Sunday. The average man accepts the reality of Jesus Christ, but fails to see any value in going to church. Churches overseas report a gender gap of uh, nine women to every man. Church, uh, Christian universities are becoming convents. So all you single guys that raised your hand a while ago, you ought to go to a Christian, Christian college because um, the typical U.S. Con Christian college enrolls almost two women for every one man. So there's your, there you can find your wife out there. <laughs> Fewer than 10% of U.S. churches are able or to establish a vibrant men's ministry. So less than 10%, so in other words, that's job security for me and for Mike and for Steve because less than all, less than 10% of all churches have a men's ministry in it. And so here's what's happening within the church. As I stated earlier, you need to have your household in order. Open your Bibles to, to Timothy. Uh, let me, I just went brain dead. Second Timothy, let me find it, let me find it, let me find it. Oh, I wish I had my guide in here now. My little tabs. <laughs> Second Timothy. Uh, yeah, maybe I lied. Uh, go to First Timothy chapter three. First Timothy chapter three, and then we're going to jump into Titus. How many of you are elders or pastors of the church? Okay. I got quite a few. How many of you are actually doing something in your church, even if it's stacking chairs? All right. So we still got about less than half the guys really doing anything within the church. It's based on on your own admission. Okay. Um, chapter three of First Timothy says this: It is a trustworthy statement that any man aspires to the office of overseer or elder. Um, is a fine, it is a fine work he desires to do. I wish he would put however. Um, an overseer then must be above reproach. What is above reproach? Anybody? A person of integrity. Okay, a person of integrity. Okay. As a pastor or an elder or a leader of your church, you should not be able to be accused of something that would be unbiblical or ungodly. Okay? Can people falsely accuse you? Yes, but can they prove? Okay? If you walk into a bar, for an example, or a liquor store, for an example, are you above a reproach? Even if you walked in there to tell them that something was wrong in their parking lot. Let me, I'm just, I'm trying to be facetious here a little bit, but are you above reproach? No, you're not, are you? How come? You could be accused, okay? All right, whether it's true or not, that's between you and God. Don't get me wrong. Now, I'm talking about leaders are, and the elders of pastors, especially in the church, are raised to a higher standard. True? Yes or no? True. Okay, all right. We're all called to live a holy and righteous life, but if you're going to go into the leadership of the church, which when I say leadership, I do mean an elder and or a teaching pastor, okay? Um, but to aspire to that, you need to start working on this as well. The husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, pugnacious, I love that word, pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine and fond of sword game, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And then he goes on from there. Look at Titus um, chapter 1. That's two books of... Okay, Titus chapter 1, and we'll start at verse 5. 
So it's for this very reason I left you in Crete that you would uh, set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, quick-tempered, and not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sword game, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just about, self-controlled, holding fast the faith word, the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. And so what we have in the church right now is a lot of men who do not stand up to these qualifications. I'll just be blunt. Okay? We've got a lot of men who, as a man, when somebody asks me to be an elder, what's my first response? If somebody were to come and ask you to be an elder, what's your first response in most likelihood? Sure. Very seldom do people say no. I'll just give you, I'll tell you that right now. Very seldom do people ever say no uh, to be called as an elder. The way that we started our church, and God led me this way um, because I've been doing men's ministry for so long. My number one responsibility as a pastor of the church is to the ministry of the men. And I'll explain to you what that's doing. We're seeing some major, major things happening. But when uh, God had called, when I felt that God had called a few of the guys that I had been discipling to be elder, um, I did not talk to them about being an elder. I wouldn't talk to their wife. I asked their wife if their husband was above reproach, if he was good with his household, if he was a good steward, if he was all of these things. And guess what? Your wife is not going to lie to the pastor, just so you know. Now, I'm not saying all you guys got to do this, but this is the way that God led us to do it. And once the wives said that they were on board, it was a lot easier to go and talk to the men. I do believe the reason that our church is falling apart right now is, and I, I've been in enough churches over the last five or six years to see that this is a fact, is that not only do we have pastors that are unqualified, we have elders uh, that are unqualified as well. And so when you have this group of guys unqualified, what you have is you have a church that is not being run biblically, is not being run God's way, and the next thing you know, it implodes. And so what we're seeing uh, across the nation is that men are just falling off to the wayside because they're not being discipled, they're not being mentored, and that's what we're getting ready to talk about here in just a second. So guys, Jesus is coming back for the church. Just so you know. I mean, that's, that's his number one reason to come back. Yes, we are the church. Okay, I don't want to go off into this big tangent. Of, yeah, but I'm the church. Yeah, but God's called you to assemble together within the church. Let me tell you this. As a pastor, when my men are reading their Bible, when they're praying, they're having a repentant lifestyle, and they come to my church on Sunday, they are there to raise holy hands to a holy God and worship in unison together. And that's a beautiful thing. But when they don't read their Bible, when they don't pray, and they don't have a repentant lifestyle, and they don't have their household in order, they're sitting in their seats, and they're sitting there going, all right, Pastor, you better feed me, or I'm going to go somewhere else and find another church. That's the problem with the church today. Churches are growing not because of salvations, but because of church jumpers. Because you're not doing what you're called to do. As a pastor, it's not my responsibility to feed you. I take you to the pastor. Pasture, let me say, change that over. The pasture, there's the food right there. My job is to lead you to this. Your job is to eat it, to read it, to live it, to love it. That's your job, not my job. So don't blame it on me when you're salty and aren't getting fed. And that's honestly, that's what pastors ought to stand up this Sunday and say. Go to another church. If you think you can get fed somewhere else, I guarantee in a year you'll be salty as you are here. So, be a man, read your Bible, pray, have a repentant lifestyle, share this with your family, and I promise you, our churches will explode. Here's the problem with society today is that 7,500 years ago, the center of communities was what? The church. You know what the center of the communities are today? School system. That was, you think that was done... Uh, and it, on intention, of course it was. Satan did that. He started that from the very beginning. <laughs> he knew exactly what he was doing with that. If you look at as a pastor, I see people, oh my gosh. And it's the, men, the men's fault. 
They're pushing their kids into sports. The school system is overtaking Wednesday nights and Sunday nights and even Sundays now. And all because we don't stand up and say, no, not in my town, not in my home. As for me and my house, what? We'll serve the Lord. But most of us now are saying, for me and my house, we'll serve my job and my society and my community and my school system instead of standing up for the Lord. So church is kind of, you know, maybe for most guys. If I'm not busy, if I don't have anything else better to do, then I won't go to church. Ideally, a pastor's job should be to preach the gospel every Sunday to those that you're bringing to the church saying, listen, you need to hear the gospel. But unfortunately, most pastors are having to give you a good pick-me-up message so you can get through the week because you're not reading the Bible on your own. You're not sharing on your own. So church is very important, guys. The fellowship of the believer is extremely important. You and I can't walk this walk without each other. It's important that we get together. In Hebrews, it said, do not forsake the assembly of, of getting together. Don't forsake that. God wants us together to, to, to praise him, to worship him, and to share in that love. Here's what happens a lot of times, though. If you will go fed, ready, excited, going to worship, know that you're going to raise holy hands that day, the next thing you know, the Spirit says, hey, man, have you talked to so-and-so down here? He needs help. She needs help. That family needs help. The next thing you know, you're serving, you're giving, you're loving, you're doing all the things that God has called us to do. Instead of going, gosh, Jody, will you just shut up and I gotta get the Methodist to the, you gotta beat the Methodist to the restaurant. You know, that's typically <laughs> what, what happens. So, church is extremely important, just so you know. Jesus is coming back for it. He wants our households in order before we step up in the leadership. And I would urge you, men, if you're not, if you don't have your household in order and you're in leadership right now, step back. Just take, take a breath. Tell your pastor, or if you're all the pastor, tell your elders. If you're an elder, tell your pastor, whatever. I just, I, I need help. I need to grow here. I need to, to get this all figured out and organized and all of that kind of stuff. Instead of leading church in the wrong direction and half-heartedly. Amen? Amen? So the next area that I talk about in my book is work. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on work, but a lot of times we are the chameleon at work. Who knows what a chameleon is? All right? So you raise holy hands on Sunday, and then Monday you go into church raising holy hell. All right? That's not what God wants us to do. We are to be the bright and shining light wherever we go, and that includes work. So I ask this question, and I'll leave it at this. If people at your work were to ask Around and try to figure out who the Christian is or who the person they could have pray over them or with them, would they choose you? If they wouldn't, then I would say you're the chameleon. Revelation 3.16. All right? So accountability is the next area. Number six where I talk about accountability. Um, and I'm not going to go there yet. Who knows what accountability is? What's accountability? Anybody? Okay, accountable for what? Lifestyle. All right, your lifestyle. Okay. How many of you here have an accountability partner? Somebody that you can actually talk to. Okay, not a whole lot of you. Not too bad. Okay, somebody that you meet with on a weekly basis or have the opportunity to, to get in touch with. And, and the reason that you want an accountability partner is twofold. First of all, if you're doing all the talking and that person isn't talking, that's called counseling, okay? That's not accountability, just so you know. You want to get to a place to where you have somebody in your life that you're, it's the iron sharpens iron mentality. Amen. Man, I'm struggling here. Oh, man, I'm struggling here, too. Well, let me show you what Scripture said here. Well, let me show you what I did. You know, and you keep going. It's back and forth accountability. Accountability is also somebody that you have in your life because of a specific sin. Pornography. Man, I got a, I got. I've got three or four accountability partners to keep me from ever going back to, to pornography because it's, it's a slip of, you know, whatever. Um, and I want to spend some time, um, you know, I'll do that in just a minute. So, uh, can, what's your name doing the cameras? Hannah. Hannah. Uh, is there any way that you can leave that running and, and leave the room for just a little bit? 
Sorry. It makes me nervous having a woman here. So I, I got to talk to these guys about something I don't want you here for it, okay? Um, accountability is something that we all need in our lives. Um, when Jesus sent the disciples out two by two, he did that for a reason. Because I couldn't imagine God or Jesus saying, hey, listen, I'm going to give you all this power and I want you to go out there and you know, share the gospel, raise the dead, heal the sick, and all this kind of stuff all by myself because I'd have come back going, <laughs> look at me. You know, look at what I could do instead of these guys are going out in two by two. Accountability is the exact same thing. And t to be honest, men, we have a big, big problem, and it's pornography. It's lust, it's pornography. I touched on it a little earlier. I feel the Spirit saying you need to go a little bit deeper with it. Okay, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time with this. Pornography is causing problems. It's causing problems in our marriage. All right? Uh, what happens with pornography, and I can tell you this from experience, all right? It's been um, almost 11 years since I was free to that addiction. Okay? Uh, what typically happens with pornography is two things. Um, one is that you end up becoming the minute man in the bedroom. Okay? You know what the minute man is? All right. I'll tell you that here. I'll tell you. I'll explain it here. And, or you can't even get it up. All right? Because what happens is, is that you have this visualization of some girl that you couldn't get to begin with on the screen. All right? On the screen that... And, and think about this. How gross is that that, you know, we're watching a screen and being so aroused, whether it's on your phone, and, and pornography is becoming a multi-billion dollar, almost a trillion dollar industry. And majority of it's coming from the United States. The number one watched day of porn is Sunday, just so you know. Can you believe that? And here's why. is because most... Women are at church. Men are at home. Okay? So, who knows what Pavlov's dog is? Everybody ever heard of Pavlov's dog kind of growing up? Or Pavlov, for you guys who don't know what it is, Pavlov's dog was a scientific experiment done in, back in the 1800s. They would take this dog, feed it a piece of meat, ring a bell. And this dog would salivate. Give it a piece of meat, ring a bell, the dog would salivate. Give it a piece of meat, ring the bell, the dog would salivate. Eventually, they took a piece of piece of meat away from the dog, but ring the bell. Dog would still salivate, you know, slobber all over himself. Ring a bell, still salivate, even without giving him a piece of meat. So it created this um, uh, conditioned response. In other words, they didn't have to have the meat anymore. Pornography is doing this to men's brains as well. All right? It's causing us to be the minute men, or, you know, the minute man in the bedroom. The problem is, is that you've been watching, and you watch porn, for two reasons, speed and release, okay? You watch it because you don't want to, you watch it fast because you don't want to get caught, and you masturbate even quicker because you don't want to get caught. It's not like most of us will go and watch pornography with a glass of wine and a candle and, you know, take our time. It usually happens because of speed and I'm just being honest. Speed and release. Speed your release. So what happens then, all of a sudden, you go into the bedroom with your wife, she takes off her clothes, speed your release, minute man, you're done. She's still over going, what the heck happened? And you're not satisfying in the relationship, the unified part of it. And or you're getting to a point where, much like drugs, okay, you always heard the gateway drug was what? Marijuana. Marijuana. All right. The next thing was cocaine. The next thing was heroin. The next, you know... So there's always this because that no longer does anything to you. It's the same thing in pornography. The reason that we have such a problem within the United States with trafficking is because the screen doesn't, doesn't do anything for us. Okay, it starts off with the missionary stuff. Then it starts off with this, and then it starts off with this. And the next thing you know, you're watching stuff that would just gross most people out. But yet, it's not enough for you. And then the next thing you know, you're hiring a prostitute. The next thing you know, you're having an affair. The next thing you know, you're going to a third world country to have sex with a child. Mm. That's what happens with you. Ask Mike. These guys are, are knee deep in this stuff. And if you go back and you ask every guy that's been busted sleeping with a kid, it started with pornography. Yep. Capturing the mind, lust of the eyes. It started there. And so... 
The next thing you know, you're in the bedroom with your wife, and the second thing that possibly happens is she takes off her clothes, and you can't even, it's not exciting to you. And so it's a problem in the marriage bed, first of all, okay? Accountability helps. It helps. There's not a guy in here that has not looked at a woman, undressed her with their eyes, and that's where it starts. That's where it starts. And then it goes to a skin magazine. Now, I have a theory, okay? When I was growing up, we didn't have pornography like that. For most of you guys that are over 40 years old, you kind of know what I'm talking about. It started with what? The magazine. magazine, all right? What was in the magazine? New, new pictures of what? Women only. I think the, the push of homosexuality and... The, the, the rapid rate that it is coming right now is being brought on by pornography. Because let me, let me just put it out there like this. If you're watching porn, it's a little gay, just so you know. Because you're not watching a woman, you're also watching a man. So this is pushing, I think, I, I, I still haven't proven the theory, but I think this is pushing the, the homosexual agenda. Because in pornography, whether you're a guy or a girl watching pornography, you're watching the opposite sex. Or excuse me, you're watching the same sex. And so that just does stuff to your brain that we don't even have a clue about. And not only that, the sin nature that's already in us. It has to stop. And it starts right here. And then the second thing is where it stop, starts is right here. is when you confess it. There are a lot of guys right here right now that did not confess that this morning. I just, I'll be honest. It's nothing that some of us around here have not already done or fig- tried to figure out or are still dealing with. So guys, I just, later on, I'm gonna give you another chance just to confess that. That's what accountability is. That's why we have each other. That's why God put us together is so, so that we can have that kind of accountability. It's killing marriages. The average age for a child now is nine years old to view his first porn image. And you know where he's finding it? From his dad's computer. From his dad's phone. From his friend's dad. It's, it's, it's an epidemic. Just about four months ago, I counseled with a family in our church I talk very heavily about this all the time at my church, whether it's from the pulpit or from our classes or whatever, because I do believe, I've, I've traveled enough around the United States and it is just, it's, it's a killer. It's a killer. It's something that society hasn't had to deal with before, like what we're having to deal with. It's never been this readily accessible. You used to have to go in, you know, to a seedy place that you didn't want to get caught going into. Now you can do it in the in your closet, you know. I mean, you can, you can hide it very well. But the, the ramifications, the consequences of it are still unfolding, just so you know. I dealt with a, a family. 11-year-old boy's been addicted for two years to pornography. And the, uh, the stuff that, I'm pretty um, uh, internet savvy, I'm pretty computer savvy, and I was going through his law, he thought he was deleting all of it. Well. I was going through it, and some of the stuff that he was searching on his computer just made my stomach hurt. Like, I'm not kidding. Nasty, nasty stuff. Last year, there's, there's, a, there's a website called uh, Pornhub that puts out their, you know, year-end, you know, whatever, all this kind of stuff. 18 billion hours worth of porn were watched last year. That's like 125,000 years worth of pornography, um, and that's, that's videos. Uh, the number one search term was rape. The second was stepmom. So you can see the depravity that is, that is happening within the context of our society and even our church because we're too prideful to talk about it. We're too scared to talk about it. We don't have this accountability going back and forth where you have somebody proverbially poking you in your chest saying, why are you doing that? Have you done it lately? How's, give me your phone. Just give me your phone. 
Can you do that? Can, if somebody asks for your phone, can you do it without going, well, hold on just a second. Leave the <laughs> my phone is available to anybody who wants to see it. My iPad, my computer. Do I have to deal with the thoughts? Heck yes, I do. I still remember the first Skin Magazine I saw at six years old. I, that's, that's how the brain works. So accountability is just talking it out, letting it off your chest, getting it off your chest, so to speak. And then start healing the soul and having somebody come alongside you for that. That was a total rabbit trail, and I apologize, but I felt like the, the Spirit was saying there's, there's some issues here that need to be brought up. Mike knows my heart with this because it's, it tears a marriage apart. It will take it apart. It will tear your kids apart. And it's one of those areas that has to be nipped in the bud. You can't just say, well... I'll work on it later. You got to start today. Amen. Amen? Amen. I would. I will stay till next week if I have to. Uh, to talk with you, to discuss it with you, to to share with you my hearts, aches, pains, whatever. If you're embarrassed, my email address again is Jody at manupgodsway.org. I will. I answer every email that comes through, and I'll help you and work you work with you through this process. If you need barriers to put up, we've got, we've got plenty of resources for that. That's accountability, all right? So let's get into our last part this morning. Any questions or comments on that? You ready for Hannah to come back in? Yeah, okay, you can tell Hannah to come back in. Thank you, sorry. What about pictures of your wife? What about pictures of your wife? Yeah, or, no, is that considered a I, I, here, here's the problem. So my assumption is, is that you want those pictures so you can masturbate when you're not around. It. No. Well, I would say yes. I mean, that's what I would want for. But um, I would say that's between you and her. Uh, second of all, I would also get. Here's here's the deal with masturbation: is nobody's testicles are going to fall off if you don't masturbate, and you're not going to die if you, if you that doesn't happen. All right, that's, that's a fleshly thing. That's a sinful thing that we have created within our own minds to think, oh my gosh, if this doesn't have a, you know, they're going to turn blue or fall off or whatever. <laughs> that's not the case, all right? God made our bodies and he made procreation for that reason. It just so happens it's pleasurable at the same time. But we've taken it to a place to where it's not, it's not even good, whatever. So let me just answer your question. If you and your wife are good with that, I would say whatever. I would say masturbation. If there's anybody here that can masturbate without thinking of anything other than their wife, man, you're, you're the man that, you know, that most of us aren't. Um, because, again, if it's lust in your head, what is it? Adultery to Jesus. Okay, it's adultery to God. And so I would be very careful with that. Second thing is, if it's on your phone, it's on the Internet somewhere. Seriously, somebody's going to see it sooner or later. It doesn't matter how careful you are. If you don't think that the phone companies and the iPhone company and the government doesn't have access to your phone, you're crazy. So I would be very careful with that. Does that make sense? I mean, that I would be really careful with that. Okay? Thank you, Hannah. I'm sorry about that. I appreciate that. Any other questions, comments? Yes? Don't forget daughters. Yeah, and that's yeah, and the, the girls have the exact same problem. And here's another thing that I would say is when you if you have that urge, I want you to think this. That's somebody's daughter on there. That's right. That's somebody that could be your daughter. When the moment I had a daughter, like as I as somebody told me that, I mean it just broke my heart to think because I've got two daughters now, and it oh breaks my heart to think of that. That's that's where we kind of have to think, all right? You gotta think, what does God see? What, is, what does God see? And I don't wanna take that so far that the next thing you know, you're in a third world country. Because we all say that it won't happen to me. True? Uh, it won't happen to me, but that's what that guy said that's doing 50 years in jail. Discipleship. And so, as we kind of bring this all around, Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Go therefore into 
all nations make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20 goes on to say, and teach them all that I have commanded you. Lo and behold, I am with you till the age of the end. Or to the end of age, excuse me. Um, that was Jesus talking to his disciples. Um, the last thing that he said before he floated off the face of this earth. He told his disciples to go and what? Make disciples. Let me give you a picture-perfect um, example of discipleship. You have Paul. All right, everybody know who Paul is? All right. Paul wrote three-fourths of the Bible. Very important part of um, the New Testament. Evangelical Christian. This dude was evangelical as they came. He was also a disciple maker. He had um, Ananias and Barnabas in his life prior to him having a Timothy, a Titus, a John Mark, and all of these guys in his life. But he had two guys pouring into him, one encouraging, one you know, leading to the Lord, and, and they were pouring into him um, quite, quite regularly. And then Paul then takes what his understanding of Jesus is and his Damascus Road experience and what Paul or Ananias and Barnabas had taught him, and he went off and taught other people. And so when you think of picture-perfect discipleship or disciple-making, it's exactly that. You and I are a Paul. There should be never a time in our lives where we don't have a Barnabas and Ananias in our life on the back end teaching us, pouring into us, somebody that can mentor us and, and help us through this process, and or we should, there should not be a time that we don't have a Timothy or a Titus in our life. So let me ask this question here. Knowing what I just said about discipleship. And I'm not talking about small groups. Small groups are good. They're really good in, you know, Wednesday nights or small group or anything. That's a disciple building, but that's not disciple making. That helps you out and it helps, you know, kind of fellowship. We need all of that. But I'm talking about true and pure form of discipleship. How many of you right now have a Barnabas and a Nice or a Timothy and a Titus in your life? Right, keep your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Fourteen guys out of all of these guys here right now that are doing what we call discipleship. And we want to know why our country and our marriages and our kids are going to hell in the handbasket. It's because of that one issue right there. And just so you know, this is not abnormal. Two years ago, I preached to over 5,000 men throughout the year. I asked that same question. And only 189 guys raised their hand out of 5,000 of discipleship. And this thing right here that Jesus said, guess what? It wasn't a request. Hey, if you feel like going to do making disciples, would you go do that for me? <laughs> it was a command. And we are disobeying a direct command from Jesus. We're not making disciples. We're not going off and sharing. And, and, and it all goes back to the very beginning this morning. Why? We're not reading our Bibles. We're not praying. We have sin in our lives, so we're selfish instead of selfless. A selfless person is going to go off and make disciples. A selfless person is going to go off and share and wash his wife with the water of the word. A selfless person is going to make sure that their kids are growing up in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. A selfless person is going to make sure that they're above reproach so they can lead their church. A selfless person is going to be the, the person at work that wants to learn, love and serve and, and share with everybody else there. And a selfless person is going to be the person that's going to confess their sins and have somebody hold them accountable to the issues that they have in their life. That's what a selfless person does. And then a selfless person is going to go off and make disciples. But we've got too many selfish people within the church. I was there. I mean, I know exactly what that's like. I spent the first five years of my Christianity, man, all about me. I forgot about my family. I forgot about my kids. I forgot about making disciples. I just wanted to make me puffed up with knowledge. And I wasn't living really right with God because I didn't understand what this passage said until, man, he finally just made it clear as day. 
our number one responsibility really in Christian life should be go and make disciples. After you know him as your Lord and Savior. So then you grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not so you look good. It's so that you can go make God look good. It's so you can go and give everybody else that same hope that you have. Because again, if we're not doing that, we might as well just go out there and tell the world to go to hell because that's where they're going to go. We've got to take this verse here right here and it needs to be the DNA of our life is discipleship. And you, guess what? Your discipleship may start with your wife. Your discipleship may start with your kids. The overflow of my ministry right now is because of what I do with my family. It's not the other way around. I don't have man up God's way because, uh, and then go off and pour into my family. I don't have the church that God gave me and then go pour off into my family. I poured into my family and I continue to do that. And everything else is an overflow and an extension of me obeying Jesus Christ. So right now, you could be starting with your wife. That's your discipleship. You could be starting with your children. That's the discipleship. Or what? You know what? You may need Barnabas and Ananias to come right now to you and pour into you. That's, it's one of those two things. And if you get, you start getting this, next thing you know, you've got both. I've got people that pour into me. I've got people that come alongside of me. I've got people that pray for me. I've got people that hold me accountable. And then I go and do what? Likewise. I do the same thing. Because that's what true discipleship truly is. Paul wasn't just this great writer. He, was, he showed us exactly what to do. He was planting church after church after church. And then guess what he was doing? He was following up with them. He was staying on top of them. He was writing Timothy letters. He's writing Titus letters, giving them advice and showing them how to do these things. That's what you and I have to be doing in the context of the kingdom. We're not doing it. 13 guys in here claim to be doing it. Now, some of you are probably sitting there and go, well, okay, I see what you're saying. Now, I, I kind of do that too. Still, it's not enough. We should have 100 guys in here doing that, either being discipled or discipling. And there's going to be a point in time. I mean, here, here's what I always hear. Well, I don't know enough about the Bible. Well, neither did the woman at the well. Can you know what she did after she, she figured out what the living water was? What'd she go do? She went and told the whole town. And you know that town knew exactly who she was. Jesus knew who she was. Knew that she was with six guys and the, the set, or the five guys and the sixth guy wasn't even her husband. The town knew that. But you know what? When she gave her life, when she actually took a drink of the living water, it changed her life. The people in the town saw the difference. And you know what they wanted? The same drink. The whole town came behind her. So don't tell me that you've got to learn a little bit more before you go off and do it. You can do it because of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. You have no excuse, in other words. If you feel that you need some discipleship, get it. Get somebody to pour into you. Somebody that's going to hold you accountable. Somebody that's going to share what they're doing. And let me tell you what, discipleship is not trying to figure out you don't need my book to disciple, okay? If this causes you not to read your Bible and not to disciple, throw it away. Use it for kindling. Now, it's getting ready to get cold up here. That'd be a good fire starter right there. <laughs> this right here is how you disciple. The Word of God, if you're reading anything else outside of the Word of God, you're doing it wrong. This stuff right here is secondary. If you need a little pick-me-up or an idea, that's what the, the other books are for. But the Word of God, here's how you disciple. This is, this is as simple as I can make it. I get up in the morning. I read my Bible. Okay? I have a plan of action. I sit down. I read my Bible. I do a prayer journal. So I, I see my prayers going on. And let's say, for an example, I read Matthew 6. And Matthew 6 is my go-to. Let me show you what my page on Matthew 6 looks like. Look at that. That's, that's highlighted. That's notes. And uh, because Matthew 6 also takes me to one of my Achilles heels is my cure, gives me a cure for worry. I worry. I fear sometimes. And so I go back to Matthew 25 and I 
read this, and I read it all the way to verse 34, and it tells me, you know, man, if I'm going to take care of the birds and the flowers, and all, aren't I going to take care of you too? Okay, thank you, God. That helped me out. Now, my discipleship that day, guess what? We're going to Matthew 26. Matthew 6, verse 26. And this is what God spoke to me today. That's discipleship. I don't have to have a 12-step program or, you know, this big workbook or we don't have to do. All I'm doing is sharing my daily devotion. And that's why we're not disciples is because we're not reading our Bible daily. Guys, it's that simple. Pray with them. Talk with them. And then just share your life with them. Build a relationship with them. And that's, that's discipleship. How many of you here have been discipled? Okay, so more of you then are actually doing it right now. So you've had somebody pour into your life. Wasn't it a good feeling? Didn't it feel pretty good to have somebody pour into your life? Imagine what that would feel to somebody else. And we're not doing it. Selfish, selfless. Which one do we want to be? Selfish or selfless? What do you think Jesus was? Selfish or selfless? Selfless. Okay, who are we supposed to be like? Yeah. Jesus. Okay, don't be like me. Don't be like the guy sitting next to you. Be like Jesus. As I still fall back into my fleshly nature, Jesus doesn't. And discipleship is extremely, extremely important. And I think what's happened over the last 50 or 60 years, we had this great evangelistic movement. No discipleship. Is really what we have. Here's Jesus, here's Jesus, here's Jesus, here's Jesus. Come, say a prayer, you know, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. We're no better for all the millions of people that have heard the gospel compared to those that we <laughs> disciple through the gospel. Because I, I, here's how I truly believe that evangelism and discipleship go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. I think in the 80s and early 90s, we had this great small group movement. It was good discipleship. But they call them small groups for a reason. They stay small. Discipleship, God's looking for numbers. And here's the deal. As a pastor, I count my folks. I count the empty seats. I count that. Not because that way I've got a check mark of look how many people come to my church. I've got a check mark for how many souls are sitting in my seats. God is looking for souls. And behind that seat is a soul. Behind that soul is a name. And behind that is the next disciple man. If we go off and just reach one person, that person goes off and reach one person, that person goes off and reach one person, do you understand how fast we can reach the world? Amen. It's literally like in 12 years, we could reach the world if we did that. But yet we're not sitting around, or we're just sitting around doing much of nothing. We're called to discipleship. It's not a request. It's a command, and we're disobeying that command. You think we're going to get spanked when we get to heaven for not discipling? Yes. If you have not led somebody to the Lord, I'm telling you what, you're missing. You're missing it. Amen. You're missing just that, that. And you may never lead somebody to the Lord, but you're still called to, to, to share with them, to evangelize them, to disciple them. But I promise you, if you pour into them, you're going to see the fruits of your labor. It's going to be a beautiful thing. And so I don't want you to leave here feeling defeated. I'm just pointing out the obvious. And I truly believe that that's the reason the church is in such disarray. The family is in such disarray. Our nation is in such disarray because of the things that I've pointed out this morning and this afternoon. It doesn't take a whole lot to get this thing back on track. Reading your Bible takes discipline, takes diligence. Okay, praying. Get rid of the selfish side of you and start going to the selfless side of you. Repentance. Get the sin out of your life. Pour into your wife. Pour into your kids. Bring the family unit back under the control of God. For you and your house, what? To go serve the Lord. Okay? That's between you and your family. And then we can raise the church back up. And when we start raising the church back up, it's going to change the community. When we change the community, guess what? We change the nation. But it begins here. 
And it ends with sharing my heart, sharing my understanding, sharing my knowledge, sharing my love, sharing my money, sharing all of these things with somebody that I'm discipling. That's where it ends. And guess what? I don't care if you're sitting here and you're 15 years old or 90 years old, you're called to make disciples. Now, I, I truly believe that we've missed the boat. Some of you older guys that are 60 plus, you've got a lot of wisdom. You've got a lot of knowledge. You've got a lot of wealth to pour into these younger guys. Wisdom is learned one of two ways. You either make the mistakes yourself or you listen to some old codger that's made them, and made them to himself. And you, you wise up for that. Don't be afraid to pour into the younger guys. And younger guys, don't be afraid to ask the older guys to help you. Amen. If you feel that there's somebody in here that you're with, the group that you're with, and you feel that they should be discipling you, ask them. And if they say no, we'll beat them up later. But, <laughs> okay, we, we want you to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. And older guys, if you see a younger guy struggling, whether he's got kids and work and all of this kind of stuff, pour into him. There's a wealth of knowledge that we're wasting and missing because we're not bold enough to say, can I help? Amen. We're not bold enough to say, I want to share my devotion with you. We're not bold enough to say, I want to share Jesus with you. Let me tell you how I screwed my marriage up so you don't screw your marriage up. Let me tell you how I screwed my kids up so you don't screw your kids up. That's what true discipleship is all about. Imagine if Jesus just took those 12 guys that he called all of them were devout. Ten of them died martyr's death. One of them died an old man on an island. The other one died of self-inflicted rope burn. But they were all true to Jesus Christ there for a long time. Y'all will get that later on the way home. Who died of self-inflicted rope burn? That was Judas, by the way. So he poured into those guys for three years. And you see what they did? They changed the world. They changed the world. Your disciple could do the same. Your disciple could do the same. Could change the world. You never know. And that might be the only person God ever puts in your life. And you pour into them. And they say, you know, they reach millions for the sake of Jesus. It's all it takes. It's all it takes. But with 13 guys in this room right now, only doing what I would call true discipleship, it's going to take a long time to reach the rest of the world. So, your challenge. I'm going to throw the gauntlet down. Read your Bible. Okay? Every day. Don't miss a day. I always say eat spiritually before you eat physically. Okay? Most of you guys looking around the room can't get up or can't sleep past 4 o'clock if you're getting up to pee anyway. Just grab your Bible. After, <laughs> after you get done, just grab your Bible and start reading. I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> Some of you are up to two, you know, maybe two, four, and six. So start reading your Bible every day. Start praying every day. These selfless prayers. Just pray. Pray for me. Pray for the leaders of this group. Pray for your pastor. Pray for missionaries. Pray for Houston, Florida, whatever. Just start praying. Let the Holy Spirit show you what sins need to get out of your all sin needs to get out of your life, just so you know, not just what sins, but let the Holy Spirit do that. Yes. I can give you the list of all the sins in the Bible and hand them to you on a piece of paper and they're not going to do a bit of good because you're just going to look at them and go, yep, 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 until the Holy Spirit says you've got to get rid of that. And then it, the Holy Spirit's kicking your chest from the inside out saying get rid of that. And then you finally repent. A lot of times that's hard. Okay? But when you read your Bible, pray, repent, love your wife like Christ loved the church. Pour into your kids so we can raise a generation that will take back this nation. I honestly, I mean, without a, a major revival or a work of God, I think we're, we're probably going to see it decline in our lifetime. But our kids can see it in, increase um, with God's presence again. Lead your church. Okay? Get involved in your church. Find out. You know what the greatest thing is for somebody to walk into my church and go, what do you need, Pastor? How can I help? Instead of walking up and 
almost said it, almost said the wrong word. Complaining and griping. Okay, I don't know the other word for that. Um, instead of doing that, the greatest thing, the greatest joy for a pastor is say, hey, how, how can I help? And when his men comes around him, oh my goodness, man, y'all better watch out for that church. Find an accountability partner. Somebody that you can pour into, somebody that can pour into you, somebody that will poke you in the chest, not scared to say, hey, haven't seen you at church. How come you're in this? How come you're doing that? I see that same countenance on your face that we started talking that you were having this issue. I see that same thing. That's what you need to have. You can either find someone to disciple you or make a disciple somewhere else. Seven things, okay, that I'm challenging you with. Get out there and do them. Make a difference for the kingdom. And let's start taking back this nation one person at a time. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Let me pray for you guys. Heavenly Father, Lord, you know, we just laid it all out there. I thank you for the words. I thank you for the spirit that I feel in here right now, Lord. I just pray right now for these guys. Lord, don't let them walk out defeated or confused or ashamed. Lord, I pray right now that they just walk out with a boldness that uh, they are going to take back um, their life with you, that relationship with you, that they're going to spend more time with you, Lord, that they're going to fall in love, Lord. Give them a hunger for your word. Lord, let them devour it every single day. Lord, I pray that uh, if, if there's a day that they don't go, Lord, just make them miserable. Make them realize that they should have read the Bible this morning, that they're going to do it before they go to bed, Lord. Just make them think about that more and more and more, Lord, so they can just know you and get to know you from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Lord, I pray for their prayer life just to be so on fire, Lord, that uh, without a shadow of a doubt, they know that you have called them to prayer, that they are, that you are hearing it, that you are answering it. Good, maybe, or yes, whatever it is, Lord, let us know that you're involved with uh, the decisions of those prayers and the answers to those requests. Yes. Lord, I pray right now that you will just put uh, someone in their mind that um, either needs to show them the way or that they need to show the way to a better relationship with you through your word, through discipleship. Lord, that they are steadfast, that they are bold. Lord, that they are willing to get their hands dirty uh, and do discipleship with each other. I pray blessings over their families. I thank you for allowing them to come here today, uh, a day that they could have been doing something else, Lord. And I pray and I thank you for that. I pray that their families were taken care of. Lord, that you put a hedge of protection around them, their kids, their wives, Lord. And when they go back, that their kids will be like, wow, what happened? I like this new you. Lord, I pray that uh, they will just pour into their families and show them all the things that you're going to show them in your word. Lord, let us just not be hearers of the word, but let us be doers of the word. Let us go off and, 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 and build this kingdom together. Lord, we need each other. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.